I'm going to talk to you today about six causes of depression in the life of a Christian. Uh, Christians will be depressed. If you're saved, you will certainly go through times of depression and sorrow and grief. And it isn't just because you had a, lost a family member or some really bad thing happened. Just normal depression. Okay. Um, I've done other studies on depression in the life of a Christian, whatever else. But I want to get into actually some of the causes for depression. Um, sometimes you might be going through some depression that isn't necessarily spiritual. Okay, I'm going to go over the six causes and then we're going to get into each one in detail. We're going to go through the scriptures, King James Bible scriptures, to show you these causes in the scriptures. Okay, um, reason number one is normal sorrow slash depression. Okay, you're going to have that as a Christian. We'll, I'll show you the scriptures on that. Number two is chemical slash nutritional. If you are eating a lot of sugar, I'll just give a little bit of a hint here. If you're eating a lot of sugar and you're having those insulin spikes and then those crashes, there are a lot of sugar coming into your system and then those crashes, uh, that's going to lead to some depression. Um, that's a very important thing. And again, I can speak from a lot of experience because I was a sugaraholic for many, many, many years. Candy, soda pop, you name it, junk food of all kinds. I loved it. And I went through a lot of depression as a result. Okay. Um, number three, environmental and where you live. In other words, your environmental uh, situation where you live can lead to depression. We'll talk more about that. Number four, relations, your relationships, your family and marriage. In other words, if you're married, if you're single, family things, friends, whatever else, that can lead to depression. We'll get into some of that stuff here as we continue as well. Number five, spiritual your Christian life, right? There are some spiritual things there that can lead to depression in your life as a Christian. Number six, personal sin. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption, right? We're going to get into that, going to get into the scriptures. So let's start out here with the normal sorrow and depression that comes on into your life as a Christian. Isaiah 53, I've talked about this. This is one of the most important things to remember uh, they'll, you know, society tells you that if you have depression or sorrow, that you're somehow mentally sick, you're not well, you need to be medicated, you need to be treated for that and whatever else. Um, but what they don't understand is that God manifest in the flesh actually had sorrow. Let me show you the scriptures on that. Isaiah 53 verses 1 through 5. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. Who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was not the attractive guy that you see in the paintings and things. This, you know, uh, blonde hair, blue eyed, you know, guy that's you know, knocking on the door or whatever else. That's not Jesus. Okay? Verse 3 He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Uh, Jesus went through some sorrow and some grief. And guess what, Christian? If you are a Christian, in Christ, in other words, uh, you're going to have some of those same sorrows and griefs. You're going to see the things. I mean, can you imagine walking around down here as God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ, and he's looking, looking at his creation, and he's looking at people that he created and gave life to, and seeing what they're thinking. He knew their thoughts. Um, that would have been very vexing. And how vexing it is, is to you as a Christian when you go out into public someplace and you see the vile actions and deeds of people and how they just don't care anything at all about God and the Bible. Oh, happy times. Just you should always be happy and always bubbly. Not if you're saved. Not if you're born again. Not if you're connected to Jesus Christ. Bone of His bones and flesh of His flesh. How on earth can you live in this life and just be happy all the time and never get sad? Uh, that's modern churchianity. That is not modern. That is not Christianity. Not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is is sorrow, grief, many times. You'll have the times of joy. 
have great times of, of peace and, and everything else. That's fine. But you're also going to have that grief and that suffering that Jesus Christ had. So is it some kind of a mental problem and, oh, you might need some help and whatever else if you have some grief? Uh, no, it's not. It proves that you're spiritual and, um, you know, in fellowship with the Lord. You can look at uh, Philippians chapter 4 for that. We're not going to go, you know, about that. But I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. But let's go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. And you know, I've said it in a lot of my studies, but I just always want to reinforce it. And that is you need to be turning to these places in a paper King James Bible if you have one. If you don't have one, then make it a priority in your life to get one. Okay? Um, it's very important. to when, it, when you're watching a video, any video from anybody who claims to be a Bible-believing preacher that preaches out of the King James Bible, they should be holding a Bible in their hands and they should be telling you to turn in your Bible. Okay, um, I want you to be able to make this your standard, not ever me. It's very important. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. The Apostle Paul writing here. Great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. You go to the doctor and you tell him that. And you say, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. You know what the doctor is going to say? He's going to say, depression. Then he's going to follow it up with, we can prescribe something for that. Which we get into here in just a minute. Verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, um, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. A lot of wicked uh, replacement theology, new IFB perverts out there, and they'll say, um, there are no physical Jews. And at the time Paul was writing, you know, there, there was no physical Jews. The Jews were now all just, when you read Jew, it's, it's a spiritual Jew. Uh, that's not what it's talking about here. And Paul actually is saying, I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ. I'd be willing to go to hell if it meant the salvation of those Jewish people. Wow. Talk about some love. Yeah, he had it for his physical Jewish brethren. Yeah, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit's going to put something within you that you're going to have a love and a burden for those Jewish people. Can't explain it. I've only met a few Jews in my entire life, you know, and face to face and whatever else. Um, and I just instantly just, I have a love for them. Why? God has future plans for them. You say, but they, they say horrible things about Jesus. Yeah, a lot of them do. They reject Jesus. Yes, I, I, yes, I know that. Well, the Jews over there in Israel, they, have, they don't re receive Jesus as their Messiah. They don't, you know, they're looking for the Antichrist. Yeah, I understand that. That's the reason for the time of Jacob's trouble that Christians aren't going to be going through. There's no term the Great Tribulation in the King James Bible as a title for that coming time. You have to understand that. God has plans for the nation of Israel. But you know what? As a Christian, it should grieve you. It should bring you sorrow when you see a Jew reject Jesus Christ. Or anybody else, but specifically the Jews, because God has future plans for them. But there should be some sorrow there. You know? Positive, practical Christianity. How does that work when the majority of people are going to hell? Is that positive? The way which leadeth to hell is, is broad. Many there be which go in thereat. The narrow way leads to life, and few there be that find it. I'm paraphrasing there. But the whole point is, most people are going to hell. Then should you live in a constant state of just positive, everything's happy, good, wonderful, butterflies and daisies and buttercups? No, there's going to be some sorrow there. That's normal to have. All right? And we're going to see as we go through this study that there's a lot of things that will be in your life that you can control that lead to depression. And that's stuff that you need to fight. There's other things that you cannot control. And this is one of those. Normal sorrow and depression because of what's going on with the lost world out there. You can't force people to get saved. 
I mean, you could hold people at gunpoint and point and say, pray this prayer or say that you believe Jesus died for your sins and they can still go to hell. Salvation is a personal relationship between a sinner and Jesus Christ. You can't do that for people. Everybody has to get to that point where it's between them and the Lord. They make that decision for themselves. And you're going to see as you get older that most people don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. Most people will die in their sins and will go and they will burn for all of eternity. There's going to be some sorrow there. And some people you love. Yeah, you're going to watch them. And you have a burden for them. And they don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. But now let's look at something that you can do something about. Chemical nutritional. This is a big one. Especially nowadays. Proverbs chapter 23. Going back there to the book of Proverbs in your Old Testament. You know, there's there are, are things in the grocery store today that nobody would have eaten years ago. Okay? Um, I, I mean, there's... Toxic food has been there for a while, ever since preservatives came out and whatever else. I mean, understand, if you go back a few hundred years, you know, I'm... I, I'm not going to go over an exact date or whatever else. It's not the purpose of the study. But uh, you go back even probably 100 years ago, people out in the rural areas and things, that country areas, um, they're making their own food. You know, early people that settled here in America, um, you didn't go and say, oh, boy, oh boy, it's nice to get this land, you know, settled here. And, hey, um, you know what? Uh, Honey, you start gathering some wood for the fire. I'm going to head down to the grocery store there and pick up some, you know, some supper. You know, whatever. No, that wasn't there. You know, you're having to get your food through foraging or hunting and eventually gardening and, you know, livestock and whatever. You're, you're having to make your own food. And there's no refrigeration, so you have to find ways to preserve that food. Uh, you know, it was a tough life, but you know what? They were healthy. And, of course, you get all these statistics that come out and, oh, it was very unhealthy. People had very short lifespans and things. Well, yeah, in the city where a lot of those statistics come from because people were taking their waste and throwing it out on the street and whatever else. But I don't buy this thing that people were just sickly and unhealthy all the time in the past. I don't buy that for one second. But let's read here. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Hmm. If you give in easily. I have a terrible time of it. I'll tell you what, right now, I have a terrible time fighting the urge to, to want junk food, to want something sweet. There's been times I've literally been sick. I know the nutritional thing that I need to do to get better, and I'll fight that thing. My flesh fights it. Verse 3, be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Now, I read this for a very important reason. Um, back when this would have been written, uh, the people would have been eating what they can pick in the area or grow in the area or hunt in the area or raise in the area. It's all local food. Now, and what, but, say it this way, what about the king? The king wants something different than what the common man is eating. The king wants some kind of special treats that come from afar. All right. Well, guess what? Now we all eat like kings. You can go to a grocery store and you can get, you know, I can go here in northern Maine and I can say, uh, walk into the grocery store and there's tomatoes from Florida and or oranges from Florida and tomatoes from California and potatoes from Idaho, even though this used to be a really big potato area here in, you know, Roostook County. But side issue but you know i can get food from all over the country i can get food from other countries you know all over america and also other countries get some uh you know whatever avocados or something like that from peru or uh, kiwis or something like that you see i can get food from all over the earth here in the middle of nowhere in northern maine just like a king would have been able to do back when Proverbs was written, when Solomon, when God wrote uh, Proverbs through Solomon. But you see, that is, you know, I can make some nutritional 
arguments there. You know, uh, there's some definite truth to the thing of eating locally produced foods. Um, you're going to be healthier because it's food that's grown in the area. You're going to get the proper nutrients to make it through that area, especially like with raw honey and things. Um, pollinated. I mean, I, I used to have allergy problems, terrible allergy problems, where I could barely even be outside. I was just sneezing and eyes watering and blowing my nose, and, and it was terrible. And I heard the thing about eating local raw honey and that that will take care of a lot of the pollen allergies. And, um, and I did it, and it's been working for years now and almost no allergy problems now. I can go outside. I can work. I've been working for... Uh, last couple of weeks doing firewood and whatever outside sneeze occasionally blow my nose occasionally and just go on about working why local raw honey so i do believe in local foods i think that that is something very smart nutritionally get back to the depression calls thing here in just a minute but my whole point is it isn't just okay we're not getting local foods now at the grocery store or if you go to a restaurant or something especially don't recommend that either but if you do that, it's now also foods that are made primarily of toxic chemicals. And you look into some of the toxic chemicals, you do some of the, the chemistry type of study and whatever, and you'll see that a lot of this stuff leads to depression. It's not just white sugar, refined sugars. Again, I have to say this, pure cane sugar is brown. It's not white. I was in Costa Rica many, many years ago, and we were actually, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, went out to this summer camp thing, and we were putting in a gymnasium floor and whatever with the church group that I was with, and uh, they had some local guys, and they were they were making cane sugar, and they had the, you know, the big stalks of sugar cane, and they're, they're you know, putting it in there and stuff and boiling it and cooking it off the moisture like you would do with maple sugar in this area, and you keep boiling off the liquid until you get the sugar. And they had these brown, you know, kind of like dark uh, brown, not dark brown, uh, well, dark brown sugar. Say it that way. If you'd see that at the store, it's a dark brown color and it's as hard as a rock. I mean, it's, it's pretty tough stuff. You got to grind it up and whatever. But uh, that's sugar. You say, well, no, sugar's white. Uh, that's refined. And they have to put chemicals with it a lot of times and whatever else to make it. I think it's titanium dioxide is one of the things that they'll use as a whitening agent. But again, you take this stuff in, you take in your aspartame, you take in uh, high fructose corn syrup and all this other stuff. And there's a whole list of things that they'll put in. Um, and you start to eat that stuff and ingest that stuff. Uh, a lot of that stuff is it, it bioaccumulates. In other words, it builds up and builds up and builds up in your body until your body can't, is not eliminating this stuff. And it, it, it you know, it's a problem. And again, because a lot of people don't want to sweat, so, you know, they live in air-conditioned comfort, but then they're not sweating these chemicals out, and then you start having all kinds of other problems. And that leads to depression. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you got to get to a point in time where you just start to say, okay, I need to take my health a little bit more seriously. I can't be drinking the soda pop. I can't be eating these candies and, and, and all this other stuff. I don't want to live like this. I don't want the headaches. I don't want to feel terrible. You know, I mean, just you can, and you say, well, I don't know about that. Okay, do a very simple experiment. Eat nothing but, but sugar junk food for breakfast and see how good you feel throughout the day. Um, whatever soda pop of your choice, and uh, I'm just trying to make a point here. Don't actually do this. Whatever soda pop of your choice, candy bar, um, some jelly beans, uh, whatever you feel like doing, eat that for breakfast and see how, how well you feel, how long you can go before you're just totally crashing. Chemical nutritional is very, very important. If you're a Christian and you're eating a lot of junk food, you're not going to be doing too good. Speaking from experience, 1 Timothy chapter 4, you say, well, I'm, I think I can eat anything. I've heard this. People say, you know, the Bible says that I can eat anything as long as I can pray over it. And, um, you know, if I can put it in my mouth, I'm fine. Well, that's not what the Bible says. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. People are departing from the faith. 
and they are listening to devils, right? Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What are these lies? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Okay, it isn't just somebody saying, hey, I eat fruits and vegetables occasionally. I kind of have a vegetarian diet and whatever else. Um, vegetarianism, I'm not going to be real rough on somebody like that. Veganism, totally different story. Because veganism, you're saying it's immoral to take anything from an animal, even honey or milk or things like that. And I realize there's probably different classifications within that system, whatever. But when you start to say forbidding, you know, or commanding, excuse me, commanding to abstain from meats, you can't eat that stuff. Uh, now we have a problem, okay? Um, if I, I'll just say it this way. If all I had was the fruit and the vegetables that I can grow on my property, which we do have wild fruit and wild edible, you know, what would be called vegetables, I guess herbs mostly. Um, and I had, the only thing I could eat was, you know, just say I had no money. And that, or, or I shouldn't say no money, because it, doesn't make sense here. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, if I had a choice to say, okay, I can eat that and junk meat that comes from factory farms that's an laced with antibiotics and growth hormones and whatever else, or just eliminate the meat and just eat the, the wild harvested stuff, um, I would eat the wild harvested stuff. I would not eat the junk meat from the factories. Okay. Hopefully that made sense. Um, Thankfully, there's some good, you know, organic grass-fed meats that we can get at the grocery store. Eventually, I'm going to be getting back into hunting again and fishing like I used to do. I've just been so busy with ministry over the last number of years. And living in town doesn't help either. But uh, you have to be very careful what you eat. Okay, it's the, the whole point I'm trying to make. But watch out for anybody that says, I'm a Christian and a vegan. Right? I have major problems with that, very major problems. But the reason we went to this text here is because anybody that says, well, I can eat anything here because, you know, um, verse 4, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. And people, I've actually heard people say, see, any type of food is good. It doesn't say that. It says, every creature of God is good. All right. If you have to eat a worm, an earthworm, eat the earthworm. Okay. Kind of gross and whatever else, but pray over the thing first, you know. <laughs> if you have to eat snake or something like that, or you have to eat some kind of bird or, you, you know, clean or unclean animals and whatever else, eat what you have to eat. All right. Um, but in, when it comes to chemical nutritional, uh, I would say, you know, nutrition is extremely important. And, I, and as I get older, I realize that more and more. If your nutrition's messed up, it's going to lead to a lot of depression issues. Again, speaking from experience. And I could say a whole lot more on that whole stuff, thing. And I didn't even get into the thing of the pharmaceuticals. Okay. Um, the, one of the biggest scams in the pharmaceutical industry is the whole depression medication thing. Um, the reason being, and I have in my study, Dr. Peter Goethe, I think he's, I forget what, uh, what nationality he was now. It's been years ago that I did that, but he actually says that the whole depression, you know, doctors, you know, prescribing medication for curing depression, it's a big scam, all right? How do you measure depression, right? If you can take somebody's blood pressure, you can say, okay, they have really high or they have too low or whatever else, you can take readings of that. How do you take a reading of somebody's depression? You can't. So antidepressants are also a very, very serious problem. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll actually make your body, you know, actually more sensitive and actually have bigger problems with depression when the pills wear off. They make you more dependent, in other words. Uh, they mess with the chemistry of your brain. So again, if you are on medication, um, you need to wean yourself off that. And I said, wean yourself off that. I would not say cold turkey because there are some very, very toxic pharmaceuticals. And, you know, again, and, you know, well, Brian, how do I go about doing it? You, you need to do your own research, okay? 
I didn't go to some magic preacher years ago and say, um, oh, oh, uh, preacher so-and-so, please tell me how I can clean up my life. Uh, no, I did the research myself, all right? And you can do the research yourself. Watch some videos on nutritional healing type of stuff. Dr. Eric Berg, I like some of his stuff. John Bergman, Dr. John Bergman, some of his stuff's okay. He's got a foul mouth. I don't like that. But those are the two guys. Uh, Dr. Mike Vander Sheldon, another one that's good. Uh, there's there's a bunch of guys out there that are that are into nutritional healing, natural type of health. Uh, Josh Axe, Dr. Josh Axe, he has some good stuff as well. Um, watch those guys. You know, pray about things. Get into nutrition. That will help help tremendously with a lot of your depression and sorrow issues. So next we're going to go to environmental, where you live. Okay. And I'm not going to continue the study because honestly, I'm here in town in the ministry office and I really don't want to be here right now uh, and talk about the environment where you live. So I'm going to be switching here and uh, going to a more appropriate location to preach the rest of this study. Okay, now this is a better place to talk about the environment and where you live, okay? <laughs> uh, not in town, but rather out in nature. Turn in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 2. Where you live does affect you, okay? Especially nowadays. I mean, you could live in a town or a city back in when the Bible was written, and it wasn't as toxic as it is today. I mean, with all the pollution and everything else, being in a pretty bad situation in there, you know, not just uh, exhaust from vehicles and whatever else, but actually also, uh, you know, Wi-Fi signals and all that other electronic smog, as it's called. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, and here's another type of pollution in the city. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Hmm. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Um... Does it vex you to be around lost people for very long? It does for me. And we live, you know, in a pretty remote area. This is, you know, our land here is very remote. But uh, going to the grocery stores and things and hearing some of the conversations that people do, even in a very conservative area, it's getting more and more vexing all the time. I can't imagine some of you, if you're living in bigger cities and things like that, is your righteous soul vexed from day to day with their unlawful deeds? Well, uh, you know, you might say that might cause uh, some depression. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can tell you that moving out here into nature was one of the best decisions we've ever made. It's always been my dream. It's, it's, it's not something that I just flippantly said, oh, I'd like to do that. That was always my goal to live in a natural setting like this. We don't even have electricity here, so um, we're not getting hit by Wi-Fi signals or anything. Uh, that stuff's, you know, I mean, it's not here. And uh, the stress level just dropped. I mean, we can go into, when we go into town to our, to the place in, in uh, Bridgewater, where we have our office at, you can just feel the stress coming back. And uh, so if you really have very serious depression problems, I would suggest that you make some radical changes in your life. One of those might be considering moving out into the country. Um, you don't have to move way into a northern area where it's very rough in the winter or whatever, but there's cheap land everywhere, okay? This land here, we paid about $300 an acre for it. Um, I've seen, you know, uh, remember when we first moved to Maine, there was a cabin we actually looked at and it was a, a cabin with, I think, 12 acres of land for $7,500, $7,500. And I've seen people, they say, wow, it must really be expensive to live out in the country. Uh, no, actually, it's very expensive to live in the city. Okay, you can buy land 
in remote areas for less than a thousand dollars an acre um, I mean literally you could save up a little bit of money go out into the country and buy some land and go out there and build a cabin as you can or or put a motor home on it or whatever else you say well that, that's a really radical change well if you're suffering from really serious depression you might have to make some radical changes you know what I mean Acts chapter 8 I'd be I'd be careful about living um, in in really wicked areas and things like that. I mean, maybe the Lord has you there for a reason. You're kind of a missionary, or whatever. But if you're starting to, I mean, you study the life of Lot. We just actually went through it in our uh, devotions, our family devotions, in uh, Genesis 19, and he's offering his daughters this crowd of sodomite rapists outside wanted to rape the two angels that were there and lots saying hey i have two daughters that haven't known men yet you know you can have them and you can do whatever you want with them it was corrupting his morals he had good moral character until he moved to the city and that was back then things were a lot pure acts chapter 8 verses 1 through 4 and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church was, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing, committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. You know, there was all this talk about California banning the Bible as hate literature. And people were saying, what are we going to do? Uh, here's a thought. Move away from California. You know, first of all, don't ever give in your King James Bible. I don't care what laws are passed. There's no just law out there that you need to follow that bans the King James Bible. But uh, if you have a city that gets so wicked that they say you can't preach, you can't give out tracts, you can't, we're going to ban your Bible or whatever else, move Okay, um, the first century Christians did that. If Christian, you know, persecution comes to, you know, if Bible believers start to get persecuted, um, I would say you need to move, move to a safer place. And again, if you're being persecuted, you're being hunted down like an animal. Is there going to be depression involved? Yes. Some things that you need to think about. I mean, every Christian is going to have some sorrow, going to have some grief, going to have some depression. But uh, if you have it really, really bad, make some radical changes. It's just like the thing of pornography addiction. If you have a real serious problem with pornography addiction, you have to make some radical changes to stop that. If you have a problem with alcohol addiction, with smoking cigarettes, um, you have to make some radical changes. Uh, those things are all destructive. Right? I didn't say that you're lost because you're struggling with sin. Obviously not. Um, but, you know, you don't want to live the rest of your life doing that, do you? I say, no, I don't want to live the rest of my life in depression or with different types of addiction. Okay, you want to get victory over that sin. Make some radical changes. What about relations as far as your family and marriage? Oh, boy. Matthew chapter 10. Because you just know every Christian out there, especially the Bible believing, well, you have to be a Bible believer to be saved, but, you know, uh, Bible believing Christians just love, are loved by their families and get along great and everything. That's a joke there. Uh, <laughs> Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 37. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Interesting, because what is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. What will cause division among your family members? Your stands for the King James Bible. Hmm, interesting. Verse 35, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Oh, well, Jesus wouldn't, uh, 
he wouldn't encourage us to be divisive and take stands that would make problems in our families, would he? Uh, he just did. Um, are you his disciple? Do you follow Jesus? Are you living for Jesus? Are you living in a way that's pleasing to him? You're going to go through it with your family. And you'll be amazed when you truly get straightened out doctrinally and you're all excited and everything else. You'll go to your uh, <coughs> Christian relatives and you'll start talking to them about, hey, did you know that these new versions, they come from the Vatican? And did you look at this one verse? They took this thing out and look at that thing over there. And all of a sudden those uh, <coughs> Christian relatives will get really angry at you. You start to say, uh, hey, we shouldn't be listening to the rock music. You know, this contemporary Christian music stuff is fake. It's phony. It's, it's bad stuff. Um, and all of a sudden, those uh, Christian relatives are going to get really angry. They're going to say you're part of a cult. You're, you're get these, where are you getting these beliefs from and all this other stuff? Some mosquitoes. You, you get up really early in the morning here, so you, you, you know, usually can get up earlier than the uh, black flies. But uh, the mosquitoes are still hardy enough to get up early morning. <laughs> So excuse me while I'm killing uh, bugs here, you know. It's kind of like being on YouTube and people in the comments, you know, they get these trolls coming along, you got to, you know, take care of them. But, uh, so yeah, that's something to think about. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You know, it really comes right down to the thing of, do you want to be right with God or, or with your family? You can't have both. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 15. I have never met one Bible believer that got along with every member of their family. Never. Um, your parents might be saved. You might have a brother and sister that's saved or whatever else. But the, the more you get into this book, the more this book is going to divide that family. It's just the way it is. And uh, that can lead to depression. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 15. To chapter 4. All right. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. You say, wait a second, I thought over there in Matthew it said that we're, I came not to bring peace but a sword. But here it says we're called to peace. Well, it's saying there that uh, the sword's going to be there. The, the sword of the Spirit is going to be there in your life. And... Uh, that's going to be there, but uh, you're supposed to have peace personally, right? There's supposed to be some personal peace there, right? It, you're not going to have peace with the world, but you as a Christian, you should have a level of peace. You're not supposed to just be depressed all the time, in other words. That's why I suggest if you're living in the city, uh, you might need to leave to get a little bit of peace, if you're eating junk food, if you're if you're doing other things that are leading to depression, just more than just the normal amount that comes on you as a Christian, um, you need to have some peace in your life. You know, and and you know, I just want to say something here too that that I find so funny, and that is people will attack me and they'll say that you know Denlinger is an isolationist. He lives in the middle of nowhere and whatever else. What about your Savior Jesus Christ? I can tell you I have never spent a month away from anyone out in the wilderness. Um, I go to town, I talk to people and things like that. Uh, but Jesus Christ went out for 40 days into the wilderness to fast and pray. So uh, before you call me an isolationist, you might want to think about Jesus Christ. He got away from people quite frequently. The Garden of Gethsemane, they went there and they, they resorted, you know, thither, the Bible says. They went out there for peace. Think about it. Next we have spiritual. Another cause for depression. Spiritual, your Christian life. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 3 through 5. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Do you do that? I hope so. I mean, if you just let your mind just wander and, and you never really want to think about anything uh, spiritual and, and you just don't try to control your thought life, you're going to have some depression. You have to fight the spiritual realm. All right. There are spiritual uh, influences and things like that, 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 you know, a lot of us go through terrible nightmares and you think, you wake up and you just say to yourself, where on earth did that even come from? You know, weird. This, this dream I had was just awful. I don't, I don't think these things, well, you're being attacked spiritually. But then, then there's also the daily struggle with your flesh, your flesh wanting to, to do things and, and whatever else. You have to fight that. You say, do I get a day off? No. <laughs> Sorry, you don't. I don't. Uh, every day it's a struggle. The war between the spirit and the flesh. You know, spirit meaning Holy Spirit. You know, Galatians chapter 5 I'm talking about here. Um, that, that's going to be there. But if you just let the flesh take over and, and just get its way and you just give in to your flesh and you eat junk food and you, and you don't want to be motivated to do anything with your life and whatever else, you're going to have depression, right? You're going to have serious depression. You need to go through this right here. Uh, <clears throat> you know, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Um, you need to be reading the Bible. You need to be praying. You need to be listening to the right kind of music. Your flesh isn't going to like the right kind of music. Your flesh is going to, you know, go to the grocery store and you're going to hear some song from back when you were lost that you used to like. And it's just going to get in there and your flesh is going to be saying, let's just sing these lyrics. Now, I can't tell you how many times I'm just walking around and I start singing to myself a, a secular song. <laughs> Stop. Don't sing that. Sing a hymn. You have to fight, okay? Because if you don't, depression. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 down through verse 26. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what I just referred to here. Well, we were reading there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Now let me just stop there for a minute. Paul is not writing this about lost people. Okay? Paul is writing this about saved people that are going through these struggles. Hmm. Let's look at this list. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You say, well, see, that's lost people. They don't inherit the kingdom of God. Um, well, uh, why would a lost person even be there inheriting anything like that? It's not for lost people. It's for saved people. You mess around with that stuff, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You say, well, then I don't get to go to heaven. That's not what it's talking about there. The kingdom of God is, you know, uh, turn to Romans 14. We'll come back here in just a minute to Galatians chapter 5. Turn to Romans 14, I'll show you. Uh, Romans 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, it's not physical in other words, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Hmm. So if you're messing around with the flesh, the works of the flesh, flesh which are manifest, in other words, there's people doing it, you're not going to inherit joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Huh, we're supposed to have peace as Christians. 
You see what I'm saying? What's it going to lead to if you're messing around with the flesh like that? Depression. And, uh, you know, if you're messing around with things that you know you shouldn't be doing, um, don't come along and ask, you know, I have prayer requests, you know, please uh, pray for me. I'm going through some depression. Well, what are you doing with your life? You know, uh, young person, are you going to some university somewhere? Um, what's it like to be around people that, if it's a secular university especially, uh, that have no desire for God and, and that don't even believe in God, they're atheists. But you're there because you have to be there and you have to get your degree so that you can be a success in life. <sighs> mm -hmm. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Have you crucified your flesh? You say, oh, it's a one-time event. No, it's a daily event. That's how you walk in the Spirit. You put your flesh down. And uh, when you do that, you'll have peace. You know, it's a lot easier to be in, in town and just turn up a thermostat and say, there, I'm just going to set the thermostat year-round. You know, I'll get a, what do they call it, a heat pump or something like this. And I've seen people with those things. And I guess it's a heat pump or I don't know, whatever. But they have these things that's both air conditioning and heat, you know, and, and it's very affordable and all this other stuff. And you just set your thermostat for 70 degrees or 72 degrees, and there it is year-round. Air conditioning in the summer months. and and heat in the winter. That's a lot easier than coming out into the country area and splitting firewood. And you have sore back and, and you're out there and, and uh, bugs bothering you and, and whatever else. Um, but you put down the flesh that way. Make things a little bit more difficult for your flesh. And while you're doing that, you can sing some hymns and think about scripture. Uh, I'm not vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked out here either, by the way. Um, it's not a problem. And uh, this brings peace. And I've struggled very, very much with very heavy depression. Um, I've gone through some really, really rough times, some very serious lows in my life. Um, and it's not all just been ministry stuff. I've been through other types of depression. Um, and, you know, so I can relate to you if you've gone through some depression or if you're going through some depression. I can, I can relate. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to look down my nose at anybody that's in depression. Um, but I'm going to question if you are not getting victory over that depression and you're staying in a lot of these things that I'm condemning here and that the, that the Bible condemns. It's not just me condemning. I'm going to have to question and just say, do you really want victory over that depression? Or do you want to continue in that? You have to make some changes. Finally, we'll talk about personal sin, sowing to the flesh and reaping corruption. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Wow. A lot of stuff there. Did you know that when you mess around with sin, and you try to just kill your conscience and, say, and, tell, and quench the Holy Spirit of God and say, don't tell me that this is wrong, and whatever else, do you realize you're mocking God? Jesus died for what? Uh, your sins. But you're just going to continue in them with uh, no conviction of conscience, no, no desire to crucify the flesh, no desire for a changed life. No, I don't need to do anything. Okay, then you're mocking God. God is not mocked. 
okay? Um, when you mess around and sin, you are planting seeds. Let's just say that I go to the grocery store and I hear some, you know, there's, there's one in the area that, uh, up in Holton that they actually play like 80s rock. You know, back, I mean, back when I was a boy, they'd play, you know, very soothing music when you're in the grocery store or whatever. Now they play hard rock. <laughs> you know, whatever, going through the grocery store, listening to Metallica or something, you know. But, you know, let's just, let's just say I, I listen to some Metallica there at the grocery store and I come home and I say, yeah, I'd really like to hear some of that again. Or some ACDC or something like that. I'm just going to download a few songs and put them on an MP3 player while I'm walking around, you know, here in nature or something like that. Um, I'm sowing to the flesh. And I'm planting seeds of sin. And those seeds are going to come up. You know, I, 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 it brings me great shame to have to say this, but God is not able to use me on the level that he could have used me if I would have stayed away from pornography years ago. But uh, I looked at a lot of wicked stuff. And um, that stuff still is in my mind occasionally. It'll come back and whatever else, and I have to fight that. And say, no, don't, you know, I have to cast down imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. I messed around in sin for a long time. Um, there are many years where I played video games. You know, and, and I got to a point where I just said, you know, how long am I going to do this? You know, oh, it's not a problem. Oh, you can play a video game. Uh, yeah, whatever. You know, I, people come up with all kinds of excuses. But uh, you get to a point where you say, you know what? Am I going to be doing this one as an old man? Um, I think it's time for me to grow up and just uh, get rid of the video games. And get rid of these things. I'm sowing to the flesh. Don't tell me it's a spiritual thing. It's not. You playing video games, you know, at all, you're sowing to the flesh. And I'm, I'm talking to the young people, so I know that a lot of you struggle with it, just as I once did. But uh, you're wasting your life. I mean... How's it going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ? Oh, wow. You know, he's going to reward you because you made it to such and such level. Or something. You're wasting your life. And it's going to lead to depression. Too much screen time is going to lead to depression. Uh, watching too many videos on YouTube is going to lead to depression. I've been through that. Praise the Lord, I live in an area now where it's no longer possible. <laughs> Uh, again, sometimes that's the only way to do it. If you have a really serious addiction problem, sometimes you need to just get away from it. Not just, you know, fight it out with your flesh and whatever else. Your flesh is very strong. Um, but notice there it says, verse 8, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit. I've talked about this before. Um, the way you fight addiction is actually to replace one addiction with a good addiction. Um, if you're addicted to playing video games, get addicted to reading the Bible. Get addicted to reading books about the Bible. Um, all kinds of good books out there that have been written. Uh, get addicted to ministry type of stuff. Replace one addiction with another addiction. If you have an addiction with pornography, then you need to replace it with something else. You know? Um, I, I think one of the, the quickest ways, and I've talked about this in my one sermon about the pornography epidemic thing, one of the quickest ways to take down lust, uh, when you start to have that lust building to look at something wicked, um, start singing a hymn. You say, oh, I, I put some hymns on. No, 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 I didn't say put some hymns on. I mean, go out, get an old hymn book or print one, print some hymns off of the internet or whatever. Um, you know, start singing, you know, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. That or, you know, uh, I'll cherish the old rugged cross or what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. You do that and see how good your lust uh, continues. <laughs> it won't. It shoots it down very quickly. So do the Spirit. You see? And you say, well, brother, I'm doing really good, but uh, 
I sure am getting weary. I can relate to that too. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Um, you can be really spiritual, and you can be in ministry full-time and whatever else, and you can faint. You can just quit. You can say, you know what? I'm just really getting tired of this. Um, that's been a real temptation for me over the years. And uh, there's been a lot of you out there that have just encouraged me, just written a letter or this or that or whatever else, and just stick with it, brother. You're changing people's lives. You're, you're helping people. I know you get frustrated, but just stick with it. I don't, I, I can't tell you how many times that has been what's gotten me through. We need to encourage one another. Exhortation. Finally, we'll go to Romans chapter 6. So you mess around and you have sins in your life. And you know, yeah, I understand you're a sinner. I understand that. You're a saved sinner as a Christian. I understand. I'm not saying you're going to be sinlessly perfect. I've never taught that. But uh, you can really mess around as a Christian. You've got to be careful. Romans chapter 6, verse 19 through 23. Let's read that. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now. What's the now? After you get saved. Before you're saved, we'll just do iniquity. What's the point of trying to live righteously? Even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. These wicked devils out there that say that uh, salvation is a simple profession that you make. It's a faith alone type of a thing. Your faith saves you. Your mental decision saves you. And there's no change after that. Um, they're wicked. They're not saved. They're disgusting people. Verse 20, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I, there's a few things I, I just pound on and pound on and I just keep on preaching it because a lot of people just don't get it. And one of those things is uh, sin is negative. All sin is negative. There's no such thing as a good sin that the Lord just takes from you because he's so mean. <laughs> Everything that you do that's sin in the Bible is negative, And the end of it is death. You know, I'll get hard on you if, if, if you're smoking cigarettes. Why? Because it's going to give you lung cancer and emphysema and whatever else. I'm going to be hard on you if you're drinking alcohol. Alcohol in, in abundance is, is, you know, I'm not even talking about drunkenness, but even, even just drinking a whole lot of alcohol, it, it's, it's not good. Very little alcohol out there. Very, uh, you know, I should, no, very little alcohol. Not very many types of alcohol out there are actually healthy. Um, you know, there's wine that is good for your stomach's sake and you're often in infirmities, it's, but it's a little wine. Um, I know that you can make tinctures and herbal tinctures and stuff out of, you know, vodka and whatever else, but you're not supposed to be sitting around drinking cups of it, you know. Things like that that the Bible condemns, the Bible condemns drunkenness and, and you know, lust and whatever else, those things are negative. It leads to death, premature death. Uh, verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. I mean, what are you, what's, what's your future as a Christian? Heaven? Um, don't you want to have a good place there? A good standing there? Get up there and, and not have Jesus be ashamed of you? I do. Verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You will earn wages for sin. I mean, that's a great verse to show a lost person. Just say, the wages of sin is death. But you know what? It applies to you too, as a Christian. You can't continually 
be in sin and not expect to earn some wages from that. It's just the way it is. So is, is depression sin? No, um, depending on why it's there in your life. If you have godly sorrow in, in, in terms of uh, like Jesus did in Isaiah 53, you know, walking around and seeing and hearing the wickedness of the people that he created and it vexed his soul, um, seeing how people were living and, you know, whatever. Okay, yeah, that's, it's not a sin to have that kind of depression. But if you're messing around with, with other things, if you're eating junk food, if you're living in a very wicked place and not leaving that area, you know, if uh, you have, you know, relations, family relations and things like that, and you're compromising to try to get along with family members and keeping your mouth shut about God's word, you know, uh, go along to get along, as they say. Um, if you are messing around with things spiritually in your life, and, you know, if you're, if you're in personal sin on something, uh, well, then depression is really your fault. Um, you're not taking care of some things. Um, God didn't just write this book as just a neat little story or something like that. This book is a guide to your life. Um, I just put together a little, tell you a little story here real quickly. Yesterday, um, one of the things, you know, a machine here that we use needed uh, some grease. It has a little grease zerk thing, and, and I don't have my one grease gun. It's up at, you know, our ministry office and the little shed that I built there. And, and I needed this grease. So I have another little grease gun here that I bought um, when we went on our big trip last year. And so I got this thing out, and I just looked, and I thought, oh, I'll put it together. It's not that hard to put together. And I put the whole thing together and it just would not work. And I tried this and I tried that. And, you know, finally I thought, maybe I ought to read the instructions. <laughs> I'm one of those types of guys, you know, you just put stuff together and, and uh, usually it works, but uh, sometimes you have to actually go back and read the instructions. And I read the instructions and it was just, I cannot believe I didn't figure that out. Oh, that was so dumb. You know, the grease little tube thing, there's a little aluminum foil thing on the top. Yeah, I didn't take that off, you know, and you got to do a couple other things that the instructions made perfectly clear. Well, uh, there's a lot of Christians that try to live their life without reading the instructions and without paying attention to what the instructions say. And the warnings in the instruction manual here, they tell you how to live a righteous, holy life, tell you how you can have joy and peace. And, uh, well, you know, I'll just keep uh, trying to put things together here in my life and, and I'll just kind of ignore the instructions. Hmm. A little pride there, don't you? Um, and, you know, as they say, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, I've, I've been through it myself. Uh, you know, I'm kicking my own self with this study. So I hope that this has been a help to you. I hope it's been a challenge to you more even than in help. I hope it's, it's been a challenge to you. If you're a Christian and you are struggling with some serious depression, you need to look at yourself and look at your life and say, uh, are there, what are the causes of this depression? Um, do I need to make a radical change in my life? And um, please do not go to a doctor and get depression medication. That stuff will mess you up big time. Um, it's not good. Uh, depression is not a, uh, a lack of pharmaceutical drugs. All right, uh, that's absurd. <laughs> um, depression has a lot of different causes. And uh, so that's going to be it for this video. Like I said, I do hope it's helped you. I do hope it's challenged you. So we will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.